near near enforcement. So so this is my first idea to discuss the patient. Where the it's acute or chronic, it is uh, any any motor, any sensory affected, any neurological, uh, any cranial nerve affected. There is any autonomic dysfunction like uh, the patient have bladder or uh, bladder uh, neural retention, stool incontinence like that. So this is my idea now. Fantastic, great discussion, Abdulaziz. I agree with you. Difficulty walking. Well, when we think about walking, when we learn to uh, perform the neurologic exam, depending on how strict your professor is, they might tell you to discuss it in a very precise order, right? Mental status, cranial nerves, motor, sensory, reflexes, cerebellar, and gait, right? Seven parts in that order. And I'm not a strict <laughs> professor, as you might imagine, but some strict professors say, oh, nope, this goes first, this goes last. But I do say that the gait comes last is reasonable. And why is that? For the reason that you said, Abdul Aziz, because gait is sort of, I call it the symphony of all the other instruments of the nervous system, right? To walk, you need to have strength. So you need your motor system to work, as you told us, from brain all the way down to muscle. You need to have sensation, right? Because you need proprioception to know where your limbs are. So you need from the nerves all the way up um, back to the brain, right? You need your cerebellum, right? Because you need to be able to coordinate um, these movements. Right, And you need your cranial nerves because you need vision to guide your gait also. A severe visual deficit could make gait difficult. Um, and you need your mental status, right? Because the patient is very confused and inattentive, they might have trouble um, walking. So as we're thinking about the gait, often we see the patient walk in, so we do get to see it first and make some initial impressions, but it still might not be clear why the patient is walking a certain way. And if, as we're doing the motor exam, we see, oh, well, there's severe weakness, proximal or distal weakness. Maybe that's why the patient can't walk. Or we see, oh, there's severe deficit in sensation, proprioception. Maybe that's why the patient can't walk. Maybe there's ataxia. Maybe that's why the patient can't walk. And if it's none of those sort of elemental functions of strength, sensation, and coordination, then we sort of look at higher order control of gait, right? So we know that um, Parkinson's disease, the gait, um, is affected and Parkinson's disease, a disorder of the substantia nigra and their projections to the basal ganglia, right? And the basal ganglia are involved in higher order aspects of movement, um, sort of the control of movement. You can think of it as, as one professor, I uh, described it to me. It's, it's sort of makes a decision of which movements we should do so that there's neither too much nor too little um, movement. And then even above that, or maybe similar hierarchical level above that, the frontal lobes, right, are involved in um, managing our gait, right? And so a patient with, for example, normal pressure hydrocephalus, right? As the ventricles expand and affect the frontal lobes, those patients have difficulty with their gait as well, but their strength is good, sensation is good, reflexes are good, coordination is good. Sometimes those patients can even bicycle their legs in the bed showing that they have very coordinated rhythmic movements. It's just the gait isn't working. So I agree with you, Abdul Aziz, this could be anywhere, right? From the brain all the way down, from the peripheral nerves all the way back up. And we'll wanna get a sense um, of that on the exam, which functions work and which functions um, are impaired. And then, as you said, from the history, knowing the time course um, will help us as well. Did this patient suddenly develop an inability to walk or has this been evolving over days, weeks, months, years? Fantastic. Um, that was a great discussion. So Gabrielle is gonna give us the history now. Um, Raphael, as we hear this history, based on the initial discussion of from Abdul Aziz and myself, um, Rafa, what what um, what are you thinking about uh, key questions you would want to know the answer to as we hear the history from Gabrielle? I don't know. I thought about uh, if this lesion is central or not central. I would think about vitamins deficiency, um, infections. Uh, I don't know. Um, ataxia, like uh, the. Uh, Frederick, Frederick ataxia, uh, poliomyelitis. I wanted to know the the age of the patient, the time, um, how long, uh, and I don't know. I think that's it for now. Yeah, I agree. We want to know who this patient is, right? Is this a child who never developed the ability to walk due to a congenital or genetic disorder? Is this a child who's lost the ability to walk. I'm not a pediatric neurologist, but that has its own differential diagnosis. 
Um, or is this an adult who has some type of impairment of walking? And over what time course has this emerged uh, and evolved? Perfect. And that will help us start thinking about both localization and etiology. Great. Thank you, Gabrielle, for this compelling chief concern that has allowed us to discuss a number of topics here. Um, go ahead and tell us uh, the next aliquot. Sure, so this is an 18 year old male patient from Lima, Peru that comes to the ED because he couldn't walk. He refers that seven days prior to presentation, he had a upper back pain of a sharpening nature and a six out of 10 intensity. The five days before, the pain irradiated through his chest and back like a belt. And also here refers a sensation of needles crossing his chest and upper back when water runs through his body uh, when he's bathing. And then when he dries himself with a towel, he refers pain. The next day, uh, so that would be two days prior to presentation, he refers difficulty in urinating and constipation. Um, so for past medical history, uh, three, three weeks prior to presentation, he had fevers, headache. Uh, fevers, headache, odinophagia, and mouth ulcers, um, for which uh, his family doctor prescribed paracetamol. His disease auto-limitated in five days. And also he has a past medical history of asthma. Um, for social history, not relevant. He doesn't consume any drugs, doesn't take any medications, but for albuterol, for his asthma, and he has no recent travel in history. Great, lots of interesting information here, Gabrielle. Um, Rafa, what, um, what comes to mind here from some of these interesting uh, elements that Gabrielle offered us? Not so sure. <laughs> Not so sure, yeah. But... Do you wanna pick out any one in particular? Sometimes the whole thing is hard to put together, but any um... one element here you wanna pick up on and what it makes you think about? I don't know, I think the, the irradiated pain uh, looks like infection. Okay, and what makes you say that? I don't know, because it gets the whole uh, nerve. The... I see, okay. Yeah, when we hear about irradiating pain, often that's a sort of neuropathic finding. We think of that maybe affecting the nerve roots, um, the dorsal roots, which can be affected um, by infection, has other differential diagnoses. So anything else jump out at you here, Rafa, that you picked up on? The, the bathing, uh, um, the pain uh, gets worse when, he, when, when he's in, at the bath. I think Gabrielle said it's worse when he, the towel is rubbing on the chest, Gabrielle, or was it the water itself? Yeah, um, so we describe it as paresthesias, and when we kind of, what we were asking when the patient um, got like these weird sensations, he refers that he he got this mostly when he is bathing and like the contact of the water, like the pressure of the water, like he feels like needles around his chest and upper back. And also when he dries with a towel, like these essentials like give, give his pain. I see. So this is triggered sensations both by water and by, by touch. Yeah. What does that make you think about, um, Rafael? Uh, I don't know. I just um, had a flashback about a telemic stroke. In the telemic stroke, you usually have uh, sensations like that. When you touch your skin, you get pain. I forgot the, the name, the exact uh, neurology name for that, but I think it has something to do with telemic stroke. Yeah. So this <laughs> sensation um, can be called um, dysesthesia or hyperalgesia, hyperalgesia, um, where there's sort of, in, in any case, if we touch our skin too hard, right, it will be painful, but when very non-painful stimuli 
um, and um, the thalamus is very specific, but in general, you know, a problem with the, the sensory system such that the normal signal of saying this is painful or not painful is not being transmitted um, properly. I think what you're thinking of is, so a thalamic stroke, if it were to cause sensory loss is usually um, unilateral, right? Um, contralateral uh, to the lesion, and that's the pure sensory lacunar syndrome. And although um, it's been described, and I think I remember studying it for the step, I've maybe only seen it once or twice in real life, there's a syndrome called um, Dejerine Lucy um, syndrome, which is a post-thalamic stroke pain syndrome, but super rare in my experience, again, because the central uh, processing of pain is impaired. Somehow patients develop the sort of painful hemi, hemi body um, pain syndrome. Okay, so something going on with the sensory pathways at the least here, I agree with you, in that they're being, um, the signals being transmitted here, water should not be painful unless it's very hot or very cold, towel should not be painful, right? Something there's dysesthesia or hyperalgesia here. Um, good, Abdul Aziz, any thoughts from, from, from your perspective on some of these aspects of the history? Uh, from the history, the radiation pain is like go through dermatome. So I think this patient have infection that affected the nerve system that affected the, the particular dermatome in his chest or abdomen. Uh, so I think this patient have viral infection like Kirby Suster, Parazella Suster virus. Sometimes the, the patient have pain before the, the rash come. So I think this patient may, may have viral infection. So then complicated by a spinal infection like transfer myelitis. So the patient developed early urinary tension and constipation. So I think this patient may have maybe have viral infection. So the patient developed transfer myelitis and dermatology, uh, dermatome uh, pain, uh, neuropathic pain. So it's my idea now. Yeah, excellent, Abdul Aziz. I agree with you here. So there's a couple of things here that are really starting to push us into the spine, isn't it? Um, first, this patient is awake and talking to us and, and despite that has what sounds like symmetric bilateral deficits, right? So that would make bilateral brain or bilateral brainstem lesions pretty unlikely. So we're sort of in the spine or below, meaning we could be in the yeah. spinal cord, the nerve roots, the nerves, neuromuscular junction uh, or muscle. We know there's sensory stuff here, so we can't be in the muscle, uh, at least not alone. We can't be in the neuromuscular junction. That shouldn't cause sensory uh, um, problems. So we're either in the spinal cord, um, nerve roots, uh, or nerves in that case, since both sensory and uh, actually, I guess we don't know if motor is involved and if the walking could all be sensory, but at least sensation is involved symmetrically um, and doesn't seem to be evolving, involving the face or above. And then you made the very important point that there's bowel and bladder dysfunction here, right? So when we hear that, that should not happen with a peripheral neuropathy because very short nerves um, uh, getting from the spinal cord to the, to the viscera. So that, that shouldn't be the case. Shouldn't happen really with uh, neuromuscular junction with muscle. So that puts us either in the spinal cord or the cauda equina. And then you use some of these other clues, right? There's this um, sense that this is pretty acute, right? This is evolving over days. That would make us think of something infectious or inflammatory. That um, pain in the middle of the back and band-like sensation, um, sort of belt-like sensation, very typical of transverse myelitis, as you said, although I believe there's been something described by one of my professors. I admit I haven't read the original paper, something coup de sabre or something, this the cut of the knife or cut of the sword where Guillaume Barre can also present with a pain in the middle of the back. Don't quote me on that, but something like that I've heard him say and have meant to read the historical paper and, and, and have not. Um, and then you tried to bring in this interesting aspect of the mouth ulcers. Lots of people have HSV1. I think most people in the world have HSV1 in their um, mouth, right? And so, you know, maybe this is unrelated, but if we try to wrap everything together, could this be herpes um, virus, right? And could this be varicella um, virus, uh, zoster in the mouth? I guess you, you could have. Um, usually it'd be sort of dermatomal, so we'd expect it on one side, and it sounds like things in the body are, are symmetric. Um, but is this a marker that there was some viral prodrome? And what we're seeing is a post-viral syndrome, either transverse myelitis um, or a, a viral syndrome of the cauda equina um, uh, or the nerve roots. The nerve roots um, can most commonly affected just by compression, right? For radiculopathy of disc or spondylosis, but there is a differential 
diagnosis there for polyradiculitis or polyradiculopathy. Um, and that does include infections in patients with HIV and a CD4 count of less than 50. CMV can cause a polyradiculitis, often in association with colitis, retinitis, and or encephalitis, other CMV-related um, neurology. Um, and um, HSV2, the so-called Ellsberg syndrome, tends to be more sort of bowel bladder predominant, and it sounds like there's a lot more than that here. Tuberculosis can do anything, but in the spine can cause POTS disease, um, which is spondylodiscitis, right? But that can compress nerve roots uh, or the spinal cord itself. The tuberculosis can also cause spinal meningitis um, and arachnoiditis, which can sort of affect the cauda equina as well. Sarcoidosis is always on the list for everything, but it can cause a cauda equina um, syndrome or a, a spinal cord dysfunction. But um, I, I, I think you're on the right track here, Abdul Aziz, that we're in the spinal column, probably in the cord, the cauda equina is not excluded, and probably in the roots with all this radiating pain. So it could be a myeloradiculopathy. And certainly it seems like this is related temporarily to a recent infection and evolving quickly. So either related to that infection um, or a post-infectious inflammatory uh, syndrome. Mm. I have a couple other thoughts, but I'll hold them, hold them for now so we can not get, get too far ahead of ourselves here. Um, great, so um, you discussed the history um, first, uh, Rafa. So Abdul Aziz, you'll discuss the exam first. So what are you looking for? If you think this is transverse myelitis, Abdul Aziz, what are you um, most interested in on the physical exam to confirm that impression? So when I, when, when I think of the myelitis, is it- Oops, uh, it's a little hard to hear you. Okay, the, I think about uh, in sensory examination, the patient have sensory level in transverse myelitis. Uh, in in early observation, of sometimes have hypertonia, a sign of upper motor neural regions, hypertonia and hyperreflexia. But in in early in early finding, the patient can maybe have a neurological shock, so maybe have hypertonia, hyperreflexia. This, but the most sign is sensory level that that can I differentiate it transverse myelitis. And the patient can be urinary retention. So well, this is my idea now. Yeah, absolutely. So the spinal level, right, can help us um, decide if there's a spinal cord condition. You can go up the back with a pin or down the back and see where the patient feels it or doesn't feel it. And it doesn't tell you the exact level, but it tells you the lesion is likely there or, or higher. So that will be helpful. Um, a neurology textbook might tell you to assess rectal tone and some of the other um, reflexes related um, to the perineal region. Um, in practice, I think that's pretty uncommon to do now just for the respect of the patient, but there may be instances where the patient's unconscious, not able to communicate with you and, and you need to consider uh, looking for saddle anesthesia and other um, uh, findings in that region. But presumably we'll be able to find enough clues here on the exam that we won't need to um, put the patient through that. So um, you made the fantastic point, right? That we'd say, well, if it's transverse myelitis, it's upper motor neuron, it's the spinal cord, we should see upper motor neuron signs. But the important point being that when something is acute, there can be what's called spinal shock. And we see this with stroke as well, right? That in the early period, we might not have hyperreflexia yet. We might not have the spasticity, it can take time to come out. So we could see some hyperreflexia here, but if we didn't, it wouldn't um, rule that out. Um, and the level of it might also tell us, are the arms involved, the legs involved, just the legs. Um, so I agree, the reflexes will be important, but we can't um, be 100% sure about them. Coming back to our first two words here, difficulty walking, we'll wanna see is sensation impaired in isolation, or is there also um, weakness or other things here that would take us to a specific location in the spinal cord or maybe even beyond uh, the spinal cord if we were to find ataxia, for, for example, which could be surprising to us, although that can be from sensory dysfunction as well. Um, I think those are the main things. Yeah, were you gonna say something else, Abdul Aziz? I'm sorry. Yeah, but that is very important to ask my mother. Sometimes if, um, if another patient, I will examine upper limb to see upper limb involvement with motor or sensory. Uh, if it's a female, I will examine the eye, if eye informant to exclude it apart of other neurological infection like or demyelination process like MS or other, other, other things. 
Yeah, right. So when we hear about transverse myelitis, this term is a little bit falling out of favor because it sort of implies an inflammatory lesion affecting the whole axial cross section of the cord. When in fact, um, one of the most common causes, multiple sclerosis, it is an inflammatory condition of the cord, but it's often not transverse. It sort of just gets off in little areas of the cord. And there's just a broad differential. You can have a transverse um, myelopathy from other causes, and there are many infectious and inflammatory conditions that can cause um, uh, transverse myelitis, right? So I agree. We, if the arms are totally normal here and things, there's a spinal level kind of below that, we know we're thoracic um, or below. If the arms are involved, we know we're um, T1 or above, depending on which muscles are there. So I agree that's going to be important. The only thing I just realized we didn't, I was thinking about, but didn't mention related to the history is what to do with that idea of water making the symptoms worse. This could just be hyperalgesia, as we said, but um, do either of you know Abdul Aziz or Rafael? Um, if the patient says that their neurologic symptoms get worse in hot water or heat in general, exercise, heat, hot water, does that make you think of anything in particular? I think this uh, is a go with my multiple, uh, multiple sclerosis with worse with hot. So this is go with MS, I think. Yeah, I don't, you, don't know what, what uh, they, have, they have a name or I, I forget the name, it's a difficult name. Yeah, I saw Maria was about to type it in, waiting for you to, to say it. Um, Utaf phenomenon, yeah, one of these eponyms. So um, to be honest, I'm not sure if this happens acutely, if this were to be a first presentation of multiple sclerosis or first that we know about, or if it's a effect on chronic demyelinating lesions. I actually don't know the answer to that, but patients with um, multiple sclerosis will often report that if they had, for example, an episode of optic neuritis in the past, the optic neuritis healed, they can see well from that eye. If they exercise or if the weather is very hot or if they take a hot shower or bath, that the vision gets a little blurry in that eye again. Or if this patient is unfortunate and this is an episode of transverse myelitis causing, uh, re resulting from multiple sclerosis and later um, they recover, hopefully, but year, you know, months, weeks, years later, they're in a hot shower or visiting a hot area or the climate gets very hot where they are, they might feel like their deficits are um, re-emerging. And that's called the Uthoff uh, phenomenon. Um, so could this be a first presentation of multiple uh, sclerosis? Um, that's possible. We haven't heard of other symptom signs. And I think as we get more exam and other data, we can talk about um, how we might distinguish different causes of spinal cord dysfunction. Okay, great. Um, Gabrielle, do you want to tell us the physical exam? And I think as Abdul Aziza said, we'll want to know what really are the sensory deficits? Are they pain and temperature alone? Is vibration and proprioception also involved? Symmetric, asymmetric? Is there a level above and below which uh, we can make a distinction? And um, do the reflexes tell us anything? And is there something we weren't expecting? Something in the eye, something motor, uh, something cerebellar, something like that. So what did you and your colleagues find, um, Gabrielle? Sure, so for the vitals, uh, temperature was 37.5, respiratory rate of 18, a heart rate of 94 per minute, and a pressure of 150 over 90. Um, general, um, he has a capillary refill less than two seconds, no lymphadenopathy, he was orientated and alerted. Uh, the, re the rest of the exam, but no exam was normal. I mean, the respiratory exam, lung clear auscultation, cardiovascular and cardiac murmurs, regular breathing. Uh, but the, in the abdomen exam, we found a distended bladder um, uh, due to because um, the patient had difficulty in urinating. Um, so for the neuro exam, um, the motor exam showed hypotonia and weakness, four out of five in inferior muscles. Um, they have, the muscles they had a uh, conserved tropism. Um, for the reflexes, the knee jerk reflex was uh, absent, zero out of four. The ankle jerk reflex was one out of four. And the other reflex, reflexes were normal, two out of four. The Babinski was negative bilaterally. Um, and the abdominal reflexes were negative bilaterally. So. 
Um, did you say a yes. century exam or, or are you just waiting for a yeah. wrap-up? No problem. Yeah, I was waiting for a wrap-up. And also the, the abdominal reflexes neg negative bilaterally. Um, so for the sensitive exam, below the T6 dermatome, um, the patient has not a temperature and pain sensation. And the, the other sensory exam was normal. Okay. So decreased tone and mild weakness in the legs um, and absent knee reflexes, present but diminished ankle reflexes, normal arms, and no pain and temperature below T6, but other modalities of sensation preserved. Is that, is that right, Gabriel? Distended bladder? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. So is it bilateral, the pain in? temperature and pain? Yeah, the sensory level was bilateral. Yeah, good question, Rafael. Why are you asking that? The emisection syndrome. Right. You have loss of pain and temperature uh, contralateral to the lesion and uh, ipsilateral, you have motor uh, lesions. Yeah, right. So this is, if you saw, you want to know if the sensation is dissociated, here it is dissociated sensory loss in the sense that pain and temperature are impaired, but other elements, uh, vibration, proprioception are spared. And if you were to see dissociation, where on one side, one is affected and the other is um, normal and the other side, the other is affected and the first one is normal, then um, that could be another type of dissociated sensory loss that could make you think about um, a hemisection of the cord or brown saccard uh, syndrome. Very good. Um, so um, what do you both think of this exam? I think Abdulaziz, you're up first this time. What are you um, thinking now hearing this exam as far as the localization? Uh, this evasion <clears throat> and motor the evasion have uh, uh, one minute. So I think this patient have lower motor neuron lesion, but they have been due to neurologic shock. So I can't determine this, this lower or upper neurological shock uh, lesion. But the question why the patient have no temperature and pain sensation, this is patient have, it means the patient have anterior column lesion. So, so the patient have uh, anterior cerebral, uh, anterior spinal artery lesion or something in anterior core column lesion. So if you have transfer malatis, you lose all the sensation, temperature, the pain, the position, and the vibration. So just if you, if you have lose your temperature and the pain bilaterally, so we have anterior column lesion. So I think this the lesion is more in the anterior column, and the most common differential I remember is spinal artery occlusion. Uh, so I don't know why the patient is young patient, why this having this lesion in this area specific area, or this patient have demyelinating process in this anterior column. Just is it, it, it's a vascular or it's a demyelinating process and really to have myelitis in this specific area. So this is my opinion. Yeah, so you make a very interesting point here. If we just looked at the physical exam and asked what the spinal cord syndrome is, the spinal cord has many tracks in it, but the clinically important ones, there are just three. The dorsal columns for vibration and proprioception, the anterolateral or spinothalamic tracts for pain and temperature and the corticospinal tracts for motor. There are vestibulospinal and rubrospinal and tectospinal and spinocerebellar and all kinds of other spino or something spinal <laughs> tracts, but th those three are the important ones because they help us determine these syndromes. And you're right, at face value, if you saw the effects on the anterolateral system, which we see here, and the corticospinal tracts, which um, hard to tell if they're involved here or if we have the anterior horns and the lower motor neurons affected over many levels um, rather than the corticospinal tracts. So we can't really say, as you said before, since this is early dysfunction, if it's central, it'd be hard to distinguish it from peripheral. So if you just saw that pattern and say, oh, anterior cord syndrome, that fits with an anterior spinal artery um, pattern of uh, spinal cord lesion. But um, this patient's history, as you said, doesn't really fit with a spinal art artery infarct because it wasn't sudden in onset. And if the patient has a stroke of the spinal cord, very rare, but can occur, just like a stroke of the brain, it will be sudden, whereas this has really kind of evolved over a week. So 
you made the important point, right, that this may fit the pattern of the anterior cord, but the etiology is not always vascular like um, we associate that with. This could be a very anterior um, lesion of some other type. And the history, uh, the time course here really still suggests something in the acute but not sudden category, and so infectious uh, or inflammatory. And um, we know where we want to look, right? At the T6 dermatome or above, but <clears throat> probably not too much higher because we don't see anything in the arms to suggest the, uh, the cervical spine is involved. The abdominal reflexes are not tendon reflexes, but superficial cutaneous reflexes. I've read about these and I've seen people try to show me, <laughs> but I find they're very hard to elicit. Um, so I'm impressed that Gabrielle and his team looked for these. If they're, my understanding is if they're asymmetric, they're helpful, but unless someone is, um, you know, most people have some uh, abdominal um, abdominal girth, right? And as a result, it's very hard to test and, and uh, assess these reflexes, right? Um, so if they're all absent, you don't know if it's your problem or the patient, you know, doesn't have them or you just weren't able to elicit them. <clears throat> and so um, not sure what to do with those, but when they are truly, truly absent, I believe that is, um, I believe that localizes to the core, but this is a little bit historical since we don't tend to check these, but I'm impressed that Gabrielle and his team are are doing this. Maybe you can teach us about that later, how you did it and what you're looking for. You're sort of stroking the skin of the abdomen away from the belly button in a, in a sort of diagonal. And then if it responds, the abdominal wall kind of winks the belly button a little bit to that side. I've never convincingly seen it done except in, in videos. Okay. So um, this is a history that doesn't take us probably too, this is an exam that probably doesn't take us too much further than the history, but confirms that we're where we thought we were in the cord. So um, Raphael, if this was your patient here, <clears throat> excuse me, um, what things are you thinking about at this point as far as the diagnosis and what test or tests would you like to get to try to um, make a more precise diagnosis? I don't know. Um, I thought about, um... Just thinking, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, you usually have um, hypotonia in the upper uh, extremities and hyper uh, expasticity in the, the lower extremities. And you usually get the, the true, uh, two tracts, you, you get lesions on anterior uh, uh, neurons and lateral neurons, I think. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you can teach me more. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So um, ALS, motor neuron disease, um, can cause a mix of upper and lower motor neuron signs, as you said, because it involves both the central nervous system, motor neurons, and peripheral. Um, we don't have any clear evidence of upper motor neuron findings here. Um, ALS should not involve the sensory system to this uh, at all, really, although some people will say there is some numbness there, but shouldn't involve the sensory system to this degree. And for some reason, the bladder is usually spared in ALS. I think it's, what's it called? Onus nucleus? Some nucleus in the spinal cord is for some reason spared. Um, but um, ALS is a pure motor condition in general, although we're learning that there can be cognitive um, deficits, but would be unlikely to, um, to affect sensation. Yeah. Um, and as far as spasticity in the lowers and, and not in the uppers, the, the main thing is just that there's a mix of upper and lower motor neuron signs. Can be, um, doesn't necessarily have to be arm versus leg, could be even upper and lower signs, atrophy and hyperreflexy in the same um, limb or can be um, more diffuse. So, oh, I see, I see Rafa's cursor moving and now I realize you're writing in invisible ink to stay ahead of the <laughs> very clever. <laughs> I love it. Um, okay, great. And Abdul Aziz, from your perspective, um, what would be the next test or test you would want to get to try to um, figure out the final diagnosis here? Um, for me, I will uh, do MRI spine. Yeah. This yeah. is the test I will do. And if you could only get MRI spine of one level? I will, I will think the thoracic level is very important. Yes, I agree with you, the thoracic level. 
And um, what I always like to do whenever I'm ordering any test, but especially imaging, is imagine in my mind what I expect it to look like. So that if it's the same, I know that my history and exam were well calibrated with what um, I saw. And if it's different, I'm surprised and I learned something. <laughs> okay, so um, Abdul Aziz, when we get this MRI, what do you expect we're going to see on there? Uh, if transient myelitis or MS, I think I see hyper intensity lesion in T2, T2 I think. Hyper intensity lesion in T2 spinal cord, I think so. Yeah, so if this is um, inflammatory, and the time course certainly suggests <clears throat> that, or possibly infectious, yeah, we'd probably see increased signal in the thoracic spinal cord. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, sorry, I already gave one lecture this morning before that. I'm already losing my voice today. <clears throat> so we would um, expect to see some type of signal change, presumably in the thoracic cord, um, at least anteriorly and probably extending um, posteriorly. And would we expect to see anything outside the cord, in the bones, in the discs? I don't think so. I mean, if you told me, if we just pulled way back and zoomed way out and Gabrielle said we have a young patient in Peru with back pain and a spinal cord disorder, the first five things on our differential diagnosis might be tuberculosis, 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 and tuberculosis, right? Because common things being common, if this patient has POTS disease and we haven't heard about a gibbous deformity of the spine or obvious um, spinal deformity, but you don't always see that, especially if it's the anterior aspects of the spine that are uh, involved. And you might say, shouldn't it be more chronic? Well, maybe it was more chronic, but now the vertebra has uh, collapsed and is impinging upon um, the cord and it's sort of um, acute on subacute or subacute on, on chronic or acute on chronic type of situation. Um, and there are studies that in TB endemic areas for non-traumatic myelopathies, we haven't heard that this patient has had any trauma. I think below age 50, um, TB is the most common and above age 50 metastases are the most common. So just from a Bayesian reasoning perspective, taking the epidemiology and the big picture, it'd be hard not to worry about um, TB and maybe the the, the vertebra has collapsed and is impinging upon the anterior cord, which is why we're seeing more of an anterior cord syndrome. But um, so would we, could we see something in the bones? Could this be tuberculosis? Hard not to imagine that as a possibility, but um, I agree with you, all other things being equal. Um, this sounds like a not totally transverse myelitis. So I wanted to pick up on the point you mentioned before, Abdul Aziz, that a truly transverse lesion of the cord should affect all the modalities, which has not um, happened here. Um, but this term is <clears throat> a little bit complicated because not all inflammatory myelitis is truly transverse and not all transverse myelitis is inflammatory. So this could still be an inflammatory myelitis that's not fully transverse. And in fact, in multiple sclerosis, uh, it's quite uh, common that the um, myelitis is not transverse, it's sort of a um, little bit peripheral in the cord. This still leaves the mouth ulcers unresolved. You mentioned much earlier, Abdul Aziz, that um, HSV or VZV can cause a myelitis. Um, so could this be a post-infectious uh, or para-infectious or even infectious myelitis related to that? Does this person have uh, undiagnosed uh, HIV and has um, uh, some underlying immunodeficiency that has both caused uh, predisposition to an outbreak of herpes in the mouth and has opened the door to any large number of possibilities of um, myelopathy, myelitis in this case. Um, I think it was uh, Valeria presented to us from Peru a case of HTLV1 myelitis a few months ago. That tends to be very chronic. That sort of breaks the rule of infectious myelopathies being acute um, in time course. That tends to be very chronic, sub uh, very chronic. Um, so the clinical picture outside of the time course um, could fit, but it usually painless. In that case, often you won't see anything in the, on the imaging, maybe just cord atrophy. So I agree. I, it's hard for me to pull myself away from the possibility of seeing stigmata of tuberculosis on this um, scan. But the other thing we might see, as you said, is just some nonspecific inflammatory lesion in the cord, and then we'll need more workup to try to figure out, is that infectious? Is that inflammatory? And if it's inflammatory, are there clues elsewhere on imaging or otherwise that this could be multiple 
sclerosis in a first presentation um, or something else. So I'm sure you got some labs and that's, that's fine. <laughs> but I think we're all eager to hear about or see an MRI of the thoracic spinal cord. So, so what happened next, Gabriel? Yeah, for summing up, I think Rafa copied all the labs that um, making it sure they were normal. But for saying some things that chest X-ray was normal, HIV negative, HTLV1 negative, Russell antigen negative, Salmonella negative, syphilis negative, uh, hepatitis B, C, and A were also negative. And also we did a lumbar puncture before presenting you guys an image. The, the pressure was six centimeters of water. It, it was in colorous leukocytes were, uh, were 10 uh, with a predominance of uh, lymphocytes were 90%, uh, zero red blood cells, the glucose were 96, and the protein was 82, which was high. Um, the ADA that its uses for uh, tuberculosis was 1.6, uh, was normal. And uh, Brucella, crypto, and Enthropex panel, uh, the, the Enthropex panel evaluates H herpes virus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight was also negative. And I think Rafa, Rafa, can you present the image? Um, making sure no one sees the last slide with the final diagnosis. Um, actually, I actually have to open it. Um... Um, do, do, do you have the image? Maybe Aaron can make your call list. Yeah. Uh, maybe Aaron, can you make me a co-host to yes. share the image? Yeah, and okay. while doing that, maybe you guys can discuss a little bit about the, the um, lumbar puncture findings. Yeah, so there was 10 white cells and a protein of 82 and a normal glucose. So um, Rafa, what is that? What does that signify for you? Normal glucose and high protein. Uh, I think it means it, it is something about a virus. Because uh, if you think about lumbar puncture uh, in a bacterial way, you have high protein and low glucose. If it's, uh, yeah, I think it's a virus. Um, if you have a high protein and low glucose, you can also think about a fungi. Um, and I think that, that's all I know about lumbar puncture. Yeah, that's very good. So if you see a low glucose, right, that makes you think of bacterial, fungal, tubercular, and shouldn't make you think of viruses, though I learned recently that there are certain viruses that can break the rule and you can see some low glucose, which um, but not, not common. And actually malignancy, sometimes you can see low glucose. You might have been taught as I was that the bacteria and tuberculosis are eating the glucose. That's why it's low. That's probably not true, unfortunately. There's probably just difficulty. Uh, the inflamed meninges are not allowing for glucose transport. The brain is in a hypercatabolic state. There are also white cells in there that could be consuming it. But principle is correct. This is less likely, unlikely to be bacterial, um, fungal, or tubercular. The fact that there is a small number of cells, relatively high protein, no glucose, would either be a viral pattern or this can be an inflammatory pattern. We all learn in medical school, right, albuminolo, albuminocytologic dissociation or cytoalbuminologic dissociation signifies Guillain-Barre syndrome, but that's a nonspecific pattern when you see some cells, very few, 10 or less, I don't know if that's an exact number, but few, and a high protein, that's a nonspecific inflammatory pattern, that doesn't tell you, that doesn't mean this is Guillain-Barre. And of course, the history is um, not suggestive here of Guillain-Barre because there's a spinal level and there's back pain and there's bladder uh, issues um, as well. Okay. I think I co-hosted you, Gabrielle. You said it didn't work. Let me see. Ah, great. So let's see. So we're thinking this is viral or inflammatory. Um, and well, it's not tuberculosis, just making sure all those vertebrae look nice and, and clean. And we have an arrow sign here. So um, Abdulaziz, you told us what you were looking for. What do you see? Okay, I see a spinal MRI. There is hyperintensity lesion in the arrow. 
So this is go with inflammatory process. So I think this patient have really transfer my life. So MS, I don't know if this patient indicated the patient have inflammation of the, the spine. Hyper intensity, hyper signal lesion, yeah. Yeah, perfect. So this looks exactly as you told us it would look. There is hyper intensity in the anterior aspect of the cord. Um, and so we can count C1 and C2 are the ones that are sort of fused, look fused at the top. They're not fused. They just look like that. Three, four, five, six, C7, T1, two, three, four, five, six. So from T6, T7, T8, I'm looking at the left diagram where I can count right where the exam told us, right? Um, that we're seeing an anterior um, lesion here. And could this be MS, you asked? Well, MS, usually it's not such a longitudinal lesion. It tends to be sort of small radial um, lesions. Um, so this would not be totally typical for that. Neuromyelitis optica um, tends to present with a very longitudinally extensive lesion greater than three spinal levels, but also tends to be more fulminant and transverse in its effect on the cord, um, getting the, the, often the, the gray matter and the sort of the whole circumference of the cord. But we're only seeing one slice here, so without moving in and out, we can't say. But this, this wouldn't be too typical of of MS. Usually it's smaller kind of lesions taking up um, a level or two, and this looks like it's at least three, four levels. So again, this is not truly transverse, and that's what we were talking about before, but it um, looks like a myelitis. The CSF tells us it's a myelitis. We thought the patient had some type of herpes virus, um, but we didn't find herpes virus in the spinal fluid, and that might suggest that this is a post or para-infectious rather than a truly infectious myelitis. Um, so I think um, the three of us converged on that diagnosis of an inflammatory myelitis, transverse in quotes, myelitis. Um, could we make a more precise diagnosis? I guess that would um, depend on whether Gabriel and his colleagues found some other PCR or uh, IgM, IgG uh, floating around in the CSF to tell us more precisely what this was, or did a brain MRI also and showed us there are many lesions all over and this patient has um, prior evidence of what was previously asymptomatic multiple sclerosis and now has transverse myelitis. Though, as I mentioned, this wouldn't be a totally typical spinal appearance. So um, what happened next, Gabriel? Yeah, I said you were all right all the time. And uh, later, um, especially for the users at mouth, yeah, one, one differential could be herpes, but another one could be Coxsackie virus. And uh, we performed a PCR testing of the, of the lumbar puncture and it came back positive for enterovirus. So the final diagnosis was transverse myelitis secondary to Coxsackie. Um, so I, I like this case very much because it, it helped me a lot to refresh my memory when studying neuroanatomy because I, <laughs> like I study a lot of how the, the medullary cord is structured and also helped me understanding some uh, clues in Guillain-Barré. For example, Guillain-Barré is very atypical for having this uh, presentation of difficulty in urinating and constipation and also, the, it, this patient had a very uh, a sensory level, so it's uh, no, no untypical finding of Guillain Barre. Excellent. Yeah, and these acute settings of a rapidly progressive sensory motor um, deficit, many people will think of Guillain Barre. The reflexes may be absent, um, should be absent in Guillain Barre, but can be mimicked by an acute spinal cord process. One of my mentors and professors, Dr. Alan Roper, who described this coup de sabre thing or whatever it's called that I can't remember, uh, but he probably won't listen to this. Um, I mentioned this on Sunday also, has written a very beautiful book about practice as a neurologist for a larger audience called Reaching Down the Rabbit Hole. And he talks about one of his major errors. He's an expert in Guillain-Barre syndrome. He's written a whole book on Guillain-Barre um, and describes some of the variants, how he had a case he was sure was Guillain-Barre, the patient wasn't getting better, wasn't getting better, and it was an epidural abscess. So the acute spinal cord pathology, because the reflex can be absent early on, can really fool you here. And um, the, the prominent bowel and bladder symptoms from the onset would be, would be one clue, as Gabrielle said, that you're in the spinal cord and not um, in the peripheral nerves, um, spinal cord or cauda equina, and not in the peripheral nerves. Um, fantastic, brilliant case, Gabrielle. Wonderful discussion, Abdul Aziz and Rafael localizing this very precisely from the history um, confirming that 
likely localization on the exam down to the spinal level, right? Right where you knew where to look on MRI, we were right there in sort of the T6 level. And then using the imaging to say, well, that doesn't really look like MS. It's longitudinal, but not transverse. It doesn't really look like neuromyelitis optica. And then circling back to those ulcers to say, is this some sort of post-infectious, para-infectious? And that's good news for this patient because hopefully the patient um, will recover from this relatively mild um, syndrome. And because we have a pretty clear sense of what the cause is here, we don't have to be worrying, could this be the first presentation of MS? And we might not know that until there's a second attack. Fantastic. Why don't you tell us, Gabriel, just in conclusion, how you treated the patient, how they did, and then we'll hear some teaching points from Maria. Yeah, so prior to doing a MRI, the diagnosis was uh, very compatible with transverse myelitis. So we were doing, a, we treated a patient with corticosteroids. And then the MRI like kind of confirmed that diagnosis. Fantastic. Yeah, and, and the, the patient is is great right now. The patient what? Sorry. Oh, he he's great. He doesn't he have like any how, more weakness. How long did it take him to recover? Oh, I don't know because um my 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 teacher was doing a, his follow-up. So I don't know how. Ah, how okay. Great, fantastic, Gabrielle. Um, Maria, you've been writing some teaching points the whole time, some that we said and some that is you teaching us. I know because they came before we said them, which is always wonderful to see. Do you want to tell us some of your pearls from this case? Yeah, awesome. I love this case. Um, spine is always a bit tricky for me. Um, so really nice um, to learn from all of you. We started with difficulty walking and I love that gait is a symphony of the neurosystem because it involves basically everything. It involves input, which can be sensory, your vision, vestibular system, and your proprioception. And you can all, and you can test those like with different uh, tests. Um, there, you can also, it can also be an affection of the integration or the higher order uh, systems. Uh, so for example, you need a good mental status, basal ganglia or cerebellum. Um, and uh, what we mostly think of first as the output, uh, which is the motor component. Uh, then we had this very interesting uh, addition to difficulty walking, which was pain. And whenever you think about sensory involvement, um, that also can involve different levels. So it can be CNS, um, and Raphael mentioned the thalamic stroke, which is a rare cause of pure sensory lacunar syndrome. Uh, and it, it can involve different levels and all of them will present differently. So if you're thinking thalamic stroke, it would be unilateral, unless you have like bilateral thalamus involvement, which would be rare. Uh, when you think of spine, you think of like dermatome or sensory levels, and really you can hone it in into quarter, the like cauda equina, if you are, if you have uh, saddle anesthesia or autonomic dysfunction, like urinary incontinence, constipation, or incontinent or erectile dysfunction. And you can also think about like a peripheral nervous system, uh, like for example, polyneuropathy, which uh, we see very often like in diabetic patients. Um, really important like muscle or neuromuscular junction, those won't cause like sensory symptoms on their own. Um, but it's nice to like go over all of the uh, neuro localizations possible. Um, and so when you're thinking about spinal cord, I love that uh, not all sensory inputs are the same and you have to differentiate different tracks. So dorsal column, uh, it involves proprioception, vibration, touch, spinothalamic pain and temperature and cortical spinal tracts is the motor ones. And those all, are in different localizations. And so if you can narrow down what symptoms are there, you can narrow down the localization. Uh, very important, like dorsal, uh, ventral, and also like, is it contralateral or it's lateral to what you're thinking is lesion? And then you mentioned a lot of spinal syndromes, for example, transfer myelitis, it affects all of the tracts. Um, and, um, but like, is it, if it's truly transverse, you can also have like myelitis, which is not transverse and that will affect only the signs that um, have the lesion. And so for example, MS may show inflammatory, but not transverse and it can have like asymmetric lesions in spine. And that's, that's a different from like the transverse that's gonna affect all of the tracts. Um, for example, in spinal, spinal artery occlusion, those affect the cortical spinal and the spinothalamic tracts, but doesn't affect the dorsal columns. And as, um, Abdulaz has mentioned, uh, the etiology is vascular, so expect sudden onset, but you can also have different lesions uh, in the anterior uh, side that are not vascular. 
Uh, for example, there's also the hemi section that is very tested <laughs> in step one. So uh, the, that affects contralateral spinal thalamic and intralateral dorsal columns and cortical spinal tract. And ALS, very importantly, it's a combination of upper and lower, lower motor lower motor neuron signs, but it doesn't affect sensory or bladder or bowel dysfunction. So that would like discard that it here. And uh, yeah, at the end, uh, all of those, all of that conversation uh, got narrowed down to uh, myelitis. And as you mentioned before, but I didn't write, uh, it's important to consider like the triggers that in this case was infectious. Um, so very nice case. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Wonderful teaching points, Maria. Thanks again for sharing this um, great teaching case with us, Gabrielle, and even greater that the patient um, got completely better. Um, and thank you, Rafa, for scribing, for the other Rafa for discussing, and for Abdul Aziz for discussing. And I just looked this up, Kuda Sabra, some of you might have been scratching, is this something in scleroderma, apparently? I don't know what that um, is. Roper called this the coup de poignard, which I think is the dagger strike. It's a rare, um, uh, presentation of Guillain-Barre with that the patient remembers some very uh, uh, sharp pain in the back or chest or something. I put the link in here. It's an amazing paper with some of the variants that Roper described, the pharyngeal cervical brachial variant, acral paresthesias with um, facial diplegia with acral paresthesias, of which I have seen um, two or three cases. So it's a wonderful historic Guillain-Barre reference. And at the very end, it has the Cuda, Cuda Pena, not Cuda Sabra. So that's some um, scleroderma thing, apparently, when I Googled it and Google was confused. Um, or I was confused and Google was showing me. Google doesn't get confused. Thank you, everyone. Hope you'll join us again next Tuesday. Consider bringing a case, consider discussing a case. And thanks again to everyone for participating. Have a nice day. Have a nice day.